Okay, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, the first time I came here was exactly 50 years ago, almost to the day. Um, <laughs> it's it's uh, terrific to be here to honor Ofer Gaber, from whom I've learned a terrific amount um, over the years. I guess when I first came, the IHS was 10 years old, Ofer was 10 years old. He may have already known more than I ever would. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I was 10. <laughs> You were 10. No, but I was not a... I was not... Ah, I was <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now, I, I, in thinking about this conference, there are two people um, who I really think of as people who should be here, namely Renault and Ekadal. And, um, yeah. Okay. So, let me start. Um, Right, so for a long time I've been interested in the fact that very simple to write down, which is to say simple for me to remember, local systems um, have trace functions which are the trace functions of random elements in, in various classical groups. So let me give you... Um, just one simple example. Um, let's take n to be a prime number. And um, yeah, maybe I should say um, we'll have, we'll be in some characteristic p, if we can stabilize the chalk here, um, fp, and we'll have. Um, an additive character, uh, well, to C cross or to QL bar cross or wherever you like, uh, non-trivial. If I have a finite extension, I'll denote by psi sub k, just psi composed with the trace. So that's a non-trivial additive character there. And um, the example I want to put on the board, if, if n is a prime number and I look at um, a normalization with some Gauss sum, which is not important right now, call it just Gauss sub k, the sum over k, x in k, psi of x to the n plus tx, t is the parameter, quadratic character of x. So here we should be in any characteristic p, which is on the one hand odd, because otherwise quadratic character doesn't make sense, and um, p doesn't divide, and since it's a prime, isn't equal to n. Okay, and um, what's nice about this example So here, the, the rank of this local system is the n here, okay, which is prime. And the, the fact is that if the characteristic p is strictly bigger than 1 plus twice n, then the group, the so-called g-geometric, the monodromy group associated to this, the group um, traces of random elements of which are these sums, this group is, it's usually SON if N is in 7, and it's in fact the exceptional group G2 if N is 7. And um, so I'll explain in a minute where this comes from. But the fact that you have this um, dichotomy is based in, actually in a fundamental way on a theorem of Ofer, namely that, um, as we'll see in a minute, um, when p is large compared to the size, um, we know that the group we're looking at, even its Lie algebra operates irreducibly. It's, and um, Ofer has a theorem about prime dimensional, n being the dimension, prime dimensional representations of um, 
semi-simple Lie algebras. We also know by a theorem of Deligne that we're talking about a semi-simple group. And um, <coughs> the theorem is that prime dimensional representations, the, the group in question, um, if, if the prime is odd, um, is either SON or SLN, or if N is 7, it could be G2. And um, another fact is that um, whatever P is, um, the group is either finite or what's written above. And the, um, this condition, P large compared to N, that enters because of a theorem of Feit and Thompson, which is a um, kind of wonderful um, strengthening of one of Jordan's theorems on finite groups. Jordan's theorem is that if you have a um, finite subgroup of GLN over the complex numbers, then um, it has a normal abelian subgroup whose index is bounded by some constant which only depends on N. Okay? And Phi Thompson theorem says that if G in GL, uh, why, so, so this, this is, so to speak, a different N than that one, if you like. G in GLNC is finite, and P is greater than 1 plus 2N, then V, P C low subgroup, G is a normal subgroup, so it makes sense to say V, and it's abelian. Okay. Now, it's, it's obvious from, from Jordan's theorem that this will be true if, if P is huge. Um, okay, now, the way this is relevant in this sort of game. So this local system is on the affine line. Now, the fundamental group of the affine line over an algebraically closed field of characteristic P, this group has no non-trivial prime to P quotients. And um, so another influence of Ofer is that I wrote no non-trivial prime to P quotients instead of no prime to P quotients. <laughs> right. So, so the way this is relevant is this. Um, suppose you're in this situation, you're trying to define if you're finite or not. Okay. So, um, if G were finite, and P is in this large range, then um, G modulo, it's P C low, which makes sense because this is a normal subgroup, is prime to P, but it's occurring on A1, so it's trivial. So in other words, G is a P group, and it's abelian, that's the second part, and, but an irreducible representation then of an abelian group is one dimensional. In other words, rank one, but our rank isn't one. Okay, so that's why when P is large, you can rule out um, the finite case and you get the conclusion you want. Okay. Do you know here about the G arithmetic and geometric are the same? In the, okay. The answer to that question is yes, if, if you have the right 
choice of Gaussian normalizing factor, then they're equal. So the answer is yes. Even in the finite case? Uh, no, in the finite case, it, it can matter. And so I'll, I'll give an example. Um, right. So let's take this, this n to be 7, so, so to speak, the G2 case. Okay. And let's try p equals 3. Okay. Now, what's going to turn, we're going, and for reasons which I'll explain in the course of the talk, we're going to use the following identity 7 is 3 cubed plus 1 divided by 3 plus 1. It's not false. And <laughs> this is going to tell us that, as we'll see, G geometric is in fact SU3, 3. Okay? And my memory is that G arithmetic um, could require a quadratic extension to become equal to this. Okay, let's try another one. Let's try p equals 13. Well, then we're going to use the equation, and I'll explain why later, that 7 is 13 plus 1 divided by 2, which I'll write as 1 plus 1. Okay, and what's going to come out here is that g-geometric is PSL2 over the field of 13 elements. And um, I don't remember what you have to, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question off the top of my head for G, whether it's, when it's G-arithmetic or not. So the numbers in your formula for seven meant to kind of go into the formula for the group somehow? Or? As we'll see, yes. Okay. So, so I knew about this Fight Thompson theorem um, maybe 30 years ago, and I basically regarded it as um, a kind of red flag. Don't fool around with low characteristic. Um, let the characteristic be a little bit high compared to the rank, and then you got nice results. And I just, I didn't know anything about finite groups. I still, that's still the case, but um, I just wanted to stay away. Okay, however, at some point, I actually looked um, slightly more carefully, which means I actually read the first page carefully, of the Fike Thompson paper, and they point out that their result is best possible because if you take SL2 over FP, this has an irreducible representation, complex representation of dimension P minus one over two. So, it's another world. Is it the, the same world of Fire Thompson with the other? No, it's a completely different paper. Um, this paper, it's it's before the odd order paper, and um, it's actually it's. There had been previous theorems of this type with um, like maybe p was bigger than n squared, and you had this kind of conclusion. Um, anyway, so in fact, it has two such. And it has, um, has others of dimension, in fact, p plus 1 over 2, um, and two of these. Okay. So, so here, of course, um, 2 times this plus 1 is p. So that's the sense in which it can't be improved. And um, this one is, so to speak, even worse. So. Okay, so on the one hand, I have that. Now, on the other hand, um, also going back 30 years, maybe 31 years, Dan Kubert, 
who's no longer alive, was coming to my course, um, which at that year was about um, Klusterman sheaves. It's not important what they are, but I was interested um, in knowing when Klusterman sheaves had healthy monodromy groups. And um, Kubert, by an extremely clever analysis of valuations of Gauss sums, um, showed that certain local systems had, in fact, finite monotromy groups. Because for these local systems, if you want one of these local systems, the kind I've written down, to have a finite monotromy group, you just, just have to show that its trace function takes algebraic integer values, that there are no denominators. And um, so Kubert says that um, if you look, for instance, so with this normalizing factor, um, psi of, now this is a different n, x to the n, plus tx, or, um, well, his method gave um, also this times a quadratic character. Um, that this would be finite, finite group if, um, if n is a prime power plus 1 over 2, okay? So at q equals p is um, going to give a local system here. Um, we would have rank n minus 1. And with this one, we would have rank n. So if n is q plus 1 over 2, then um, we'll either have q minus 1 over 2 if we don't have a quadratic character, or we'll have q plus 1 over 2. Okay. And he also proved by this in incredibly clever argument that if n was q to the d plus 1 over q plus 1 with d odd, which is what you need to be sure that the bottom divides the top, okay, then this would also give you finite monodromy. And in fact, the, the technology um, that he employed can be used to make it, in, in this case, um, slightly better. Instead of just transferring with a quadratic character, you can do with any character of order dividing q plus 1, not just order 2. Okay. So you have all these local systems that, by these, these old results of Kubert, have some kind of finite monodromy groups. And um, I basically didn't think about it anymore for a long time. Right. And what changed? Uh, how do I get the top one down? <coughs> oh my god. This is terrifying. So, uh, no, that's okay. I think I just erased what I wanted to refer to. Um, right. So then, um, I guess it's at this point almost two years ago, I stumbled upon 
a 2010 paper by Dick Gross. And in that paper, Dick Gross analyzes what the lean listic theory does in the case of PGL2 and PU3. And in both cases, he tells you that um, by thinking about the lean listic theory in both of these cases, you make local systems on P1 minus 0 and infinity, um, whose groups are these groups, okay, um, with local monodromy at 0 and infinity given, so to speak, explicitly in terms of the group. So for instance, local monodromy at infinity um, will involve um, a Borel subgroup and its unipotent radical. Local monodromy at zero will involve what he calls a Coxeter torus. So it's completely explicit. And because um, from thinking about Klusterman and hypergeometric sheaves, I, I knew something about local systems like this. So I saw that if you take these local systems with the known local monodromy and push them out by representations, so there's a, t a slight technical point that you have to understand what happens when you go from PGL down to PSL2. That's a subgroup of index T. And here you have to go down to PSU3. But what happens when you push out by representations of these groups um, and using some rigidity, you can actually prove that um, you are getting the geometric monodromy groups to be, in this case, um, SL or PSL, and in this kind of case, well, SU, um, it ha only when D is 3, or PSU. But the point is that um, the, these numerical formulas about uh, seven, they're not an accident. Okay, so this is where I was at a certain point. And um, then a sort of funny thing happened, namely, Well, two funny things happened. So, <coughs> plugging in what Dick Rose had done gave me not the representations of PSL. So, in this in this kind of story, um, where P could be Q, whichever of these dimensions is odd. And since they differ by one, there's only, only one such. That's a representation of PSL. And the other one is a faithful representation of SL. You just have to look whether the element minus one, um, what its trace is to see. Okay. And um, so I knew something about. Um, one of these local systems, I knew it would have PSL2, and the other one should have SL2, but I didn't see how to do this. So I said, all right, well, these two dimensions differ by one. So let's try something which looks ridiculous on its face. Let's look at SIM2 of the small one, the, the, the low dimensional one. 
And let's look at exterior two of the high dimensional one. I mean, high and low, they only differ by one. Since they only differ by one, these two local systems at least have the same size as each other. Okay? Now, in general, this would be an idiotic thing to do. For instance, if, um, if you were talking about um, a low dimensional, say, a, a 10 dimensional representation of the symplectic group, and you did this, you'd be getting the Lie algebra. And if you talked about an 11 dimensional representation of the orthogonal group, you'd be getting its Lie algebra. So how could they have anything to do with each other? Nonetheless, it turned out that in this q plus 1 over 2 game, they were isomorphic. Okay? So th there are two parts to the statement. One is the statement that um, in the representation theory of these groups, when you take sim2, now you have to be careful because there, there are two of each dimension. So the statement is that sim2 of a low one is exterior to of a correctly chosen high one. So that's one statement. On the other hand, if I'm trying to prove something about my local systems, I need to know that it's also true that my local systems behave in this way. Okay? So Ron Evans, a man who can prove any identity about exponential sums that is in fact true, um, did the, um, the Psi identity. And um, because the, the character table of, of SL2Q, and Q is a, a power of an odd prime, is simple enough, I could actually see by looking that this was a true statement about the representation theory. OK. So the next thing that happened was I wrote to Goralnik, who's a serious expert on finite groups, and I asked him if this was a known thing. And he said, no. But in fact, he said, um, the same thing is true The same thing is true for the symplectic group. Now, so I have to explain what that means. And for me, it was, it was like amazingly new information. So let me tell you what that was. Okay, so we're going to look at um, an SL2, um, and let me write it just as Q to the N. Q could be P, but not just SL2 of a prime field. Okay. Now, of course, if you think of this as um, automorphisms of a two-dimensional vector space over this field, um, it's not hard to see that you can embed this group into the symplectic group of size 2n over fq. Just thinking about the two-dimensional vector space over fqn as an n-dimensional, as a 2n-dimensional vector space over fq and with some obvious um, symplectic form. Okay. Right, now, this group, or PSL, is going to map by the representation theory into some humongous SLQ plus or minus 1 over 2 group, like so. Okay. And apparently, um, in the world of um, simple or nearly simple groups, when you take such a group and map it into some big SL um, by an irreducible representation, apparently what's typical is that what you get 
The image is already a so-called maximal subgroup. There aren't bigger finite groups in here that contain this image. Okay? But what's special, and which came as a complete um, revelation to me, is that this bigger group has a representation of the same dimension. And in fact, so this group has representations, representations of dimension Qn plus or minus 1 over 2, 2 of each flavor. And when you take one of these representations and restrict it to this much smaller group, you're getting the irreducible representation that we had here. Okay. That's somehow, um, I think, quite remarkable. And for me, it was completely new information. So um, on the one hand, it made me wonder about local system or systems to give symplectic groups as monotremy groups. But again, m my criterion was, um, yeah, maybe I should say, I mentioned Raynaud at the beginning of the talk. Now, of course, Raynaud proved the Abiyankar conjecture that any finite group generated by its PCLO subgroups um, will occur as uh, a quotient, a finite quotient of the fundamental group at the affine line over an algebraically closed field of characteristic P. And any of these groups uh, certainly have that property. So they certainly occur. And therefore, you can write down something that's going to make them occur. And in fact, Bianca wrote down lots of things that made them occur. But I, I wanted simple things that I could remember. Okay, so that's, that was one piece of information. And <coughs> whoops, why didn't it go on? You mentioned some words about the image being a maximal sample. Yes. But once you have a representation of the larger symplectic group, Yes, so this is an example where it's not true. Okay. Right. And then, uh, I guess because of um, what Dick Gross had done about SU3, I, I learned a little about um, SUN odd, so different n yet, uh, at least three, q, and q is an odd prime power. Um, and its lowest dimensional representations, sorry, next to lowest, there's one of dimension q, so this n is the D that was over there, Qn plus 1 over Q plus 1 take away 1. There's one of these, and they're Q of this entire dimension, Qn plus 1 over Q plus 1. And the, the so to speak, naming scheme of these is um, they're parameterized by multiplicative characters, chi of order dividing q plus 1. So here, the relevant character is the trivial character. And here, it's the q non-trivial characters. Okay. So and these were the numbers that Kubert had said, had proven, gave finite groups. Right, so the obvious um, conjecture then was that um, when you did the local systems with this kind of n and characters like this, you were getting the representation theory of SUN and being odd, like so. And um, 
So both, if you like both hopes, um, are pretty much okay. And um, that's entirely due to joint work with TF, which I'll try and explain just the broad basic ideas of that, that make this come out okay. Okay. Um, So a difference between the symplectic case and the special unitary case, um, at least at this point in the exposition, difference is that in the case of SU, we had our candidate already. On the other hand, we didn't have a candidate for the symplectic case. We, we thought maybe there was one, but <coughs> okay. So So let's, let me go back to the SL2, but let me write it with QN. And instead of trying to write down or writing down candidates um, for one of these and one of these, I'm going to write down a reducible local system, which will be the direct sum of one of each. So let me write that down. Um, I would write down so a, a suitable normal, normalizing Gauss sum, the sum over x in k. So, I, so in, instead of writing qn plus 1 over 2, I'm going to write qn plus 1. And then I'm going to write, instead of t times x, t times x squared. Okay. Now if I separate out, so to speak, the squareness and the non-squareness, I'm going to get the thing I had before with this divided in half and this divided in half, once alone and once with a quadratic character. Okay. So this will be one representation of qn minus 1 over 2 plus 1 of dimension qn plus 1 over 2. So can you say again what you're, so, uh, how do you, first of all, homologically, does it correspond to, it correspond to higher direct image of which degree of sound? I just want to, if these were divided in half, and I just had a, an x here, I would just think of it as a Fourier transform. Um, so if you like, this is the Fourier transform of L C of x q n plus one over two directs um, L C of x q n plus one over two tensor quadratic character. Those are my two pieces. Right. And in, but in fact, when you write the thing this way, um, You get a different proof from Kubert's proof that this kind of thing will have finite monodromy because there's a, a um, paper that came later than Kubert by um, Van der Geer and Van der Flucht, which talks about these kind of sums, psi of what they call maybe R of x 
times x, and this r of x is supposed to be maybe what I would call q linear. So you see here that here I have x qn plus x um, plus tx, if you like, times x. That's what's inside. So this is my q linear polynomial, and this is my x. That by a very clever but elementary argument, this kind of local system, well, this kind of sum individually with, with the suitable Gauss sum will have algebraic integer values, and um, therefore that this kind of local system will have finite minor values. So it's another way of thinking about the same question. Right. Anyway, so at this point, without any underlying conceptual reason, I said, well, suppose we were to look instead Qn plus 1, let's have a two-parameter family, Q plus 1 plus T x squared. So this is also going to break up into two pieces. Um, and so what do we know about this? We know that um, on the one hand, this is going to land, it's going to be a sum of two representations of the right dimension. Um, and when we put s to 0, we know that we get SL2 q to the n. Okay. And um, <coughs> basically, the idea is that um, We're now going to have a group that's sitting between SL2 q to the n, our G geometric, because when you specialize, you get something smaller. And um, on our priori grounds, this is going to end up in a big SL um, qn. Okay. And basically, the theorem that he approved was that, on the one hand, um, this, this intermediate group And I'll oversimplify this, but to a first approximation, um, if you factor this n, then in between you'll have SL2 q to the n. That'll be in an SP 2a of q to the b. And that'll be in an SP 2n of q. And in fact, um, there are actually a few more possibilities, but ballpark, there aren't so many possibilities for what this guy is. And we know that we're talking about the restriction to this group of a very special representation of the symplectic group because these special representations already restrict all the way down here to these special representations. And the group theory people know that if you had a group like this, then when you looked at the square absolute values of traces in these representations, you would be getting powers of q to the b. 
Okay. And by looking at this local system and choosing S and T, not all that cleverly, um, you could get a square absolute value equal to Q. So there are some technical things. And in fact, um, what you end up with is that you'll get SP 2NQ from this um, provided that, first of all, P doesn't divide this N if you're in characteristic P. And um, P doesn't divide the power of P that is Q. So maybe, uh, in a kind of overly complicated logs of P of Q. All right, so it's some, it's some technical business, but um, basically that this works. OK, now the next step. is we say, all right, so here we used the trick that when we put s equal to 0, we got something we knew. And therefore, whatever we were getting at least contained that. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put t to 0. So now we know on the one hand that we're inside. So now for this guy, we have a new G geometric when t is 0. We know that we're inside what we had proven before, which was at this sp2n q. But now we have something special because when we just take this much of the local system. That's what it means to put t equal to 0. This thing now becomes a direct sum of where you have psi of x qn plus 1 over q plus 1 plus sx times a chi of x, where here the order of chi divides Q plus 1. Same, just extracting, uh, breaking up this Q, these Q plus first powers. And that's why we need n to be odd so that Q plus 1 divides Qn plus 1. Okay. So we'll get this if n is odd. OK. Right. So now we come to another miracle provided by Tiab that if you have a subgroup of the symplectic group such that this q to the n special dimensional special representation, which was the direct sum of two pieces here, that when you restrict it here, a subgroup, it breaks up into q plus 1 pieces with the ranks that you're getting, then automatically you have this corresponding big representation of the special unitary group, the direct sum of all these pieces. So it's like a miracle. And so my role was to guess some local systems. And Tiep would tell me, well, if you could just prove this or that, um, then by group theory, you would know the rest. And I could prove this or that. So thank you very much. Are there any questions or remarks? Hmm. So in the last thing, you have also to know that the group is not smaller than the, you said there is a group theoretical result. Uh, so first of all, you are, you, there is also the question of the arithmetic and uh, I don't know if the arithmetic comparison of arithmetic and geometric, because the, the right. values are, are give you things in the arithmetic. Uh, Correct. So the um, 
In the case of the symplectic group, when, when the theorem applies, so with many things being primed to P, then um, my memory is that when you, so these local systems make sense over the, on A1 over the prime field. When you extend scalars in the symplectic case to the FQ, then my memory is that G geometric is already equal to G arithmetic. In the case, in, in this uh, special unitary thing, um, you already need to work over the field of Q squared elements just so that you have these characters available. And then um, at least the a priori, a priori argument I could make required a pretty big extension of FQ squared to get G geometric, to get G arithmetic down to uh, being G geometric. Okay. So, and also you have to, to, to know that you get exactly the group you expect, you need to know it cannot be small. You said that if you have a representation that breaks down, yes. then it is, the group is contained in the one you expect. No, no, no. If, a, if I have a subgroup of the symplectic group and the representation breaks up, then that group is. There is no smaller, ah, you the said that there is this uh, SL. No, which one are you, which situation are you thinking about? Not this one. Not this. So, when I assume that, to, to make life simple, let me assume that both Q as a power of P is um, a prime to P power of P, which sounds ridiculous, and N is also prime to P. Yeah. All right. Then I know that my monodromy group in my symplectic candidate has grouped the full SP, not one of these intermediate. The intermediate things had to be ruled out to get to SP. Yes, okay. okay. Once you have SP, then Tiep tells us that if you have a subgroup of the SP, such that this so-called they representation of SP breaks up into pieces of irreducible pieces of these sizes, then it's automatically okay. What you so want. The reducible begin by the geometry. Yes. Yes. So you, just add, you could just add more parameters, right? You could add more terms there with your different powers of Q. Correct. It would still be symplectic group. So do you know if the covering of the affine N space you get by doing that is related to the Dillian Lustig variety for SP 2N? I can answer that question very quickly. No. <laughs> but there is a man here who might be able to help you. <laughs> there aren't any more questions? Then, uh, then uh, we thank the speaker again.